Father, send your Holy Spirit in a profound and significant way. Let it fall on each of our hearts individually. Let it fall on us corporately. Let Him do the work to transform us to burden us, to grant us a sense of urgency, and to recognize that all of this comes in the power of Christ alone. And we ask this in that name that is above every name. Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior, our Christ. Amen. I'm doing something this morning that I rarely do, extremely rare. I think I've done it one other time in my tenure at Oakcrest, and that is to go off topic. We will not be in 1 Samuel this morning, We're actually in the book of John chapter 12. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. The reason we're doing this is I have a great burden to share with you what I believe is the quintessential issue facing our congregation as a church. I strongly feel encouraged and a sense of a renewed, revived spirit in terms of who we are as a body and our continued growth in unity and our desire to love one another, to serve one another, our desire to continue to grow in that sense of fellowship and love. And if that is the case, then we must be committed to fulfilling the task that God has given us. And that is to Obey the great commandment and fulfill the great commission. And I want to speak specifically to the latter of those. Unfortunately, far too many churches, even our Southern Baptist churches that historically have been above the curve as far as the mainline denominations sliding toward liberalism, sliding in efforts of evangelism and outreach. Unfortunately, we are not lifting up Jesus that he may draw men unto himself. We are focused inwardly and focused so often selfishly. We are lifting up man-made agendas and man-made self-help programs and man-made buildings. And I believe firmly that American evangelicalism is at a crossroads of decision. And sadly, many have already taken the broad road. And I also believe firmly that Oakcrest is at a moment of decision. We are at a crossroads, if you will. And it is a time that we must commit, recommit to live with boldness what we confess. And that is the simple fact that Life and death lies in the reality of whether people have had a personal encounter with the living Christ. All of us on the face of the earth are in relationship with Christ in the sense that God is our creator. The question is, are we under condemnation or justification? And the difference between those two categories is the simple gospel message. And the gospel message is that we 
see Jesus. In, I'm using the word see in the sense that the psalmist uses it when he says, taste and see that God is good. Experience that God is good. Know that God is good. Know that Jesus is the Christ. People must taste and see and know Jesus. This is by far and away the most important reality of human existence. It is more important than anything that is taking place in the political theater of today. It is more important than your relationship with your spouse or your children, as important as that is. That we understand that people must see Jesus is supremely important. And here's why I'm saying this to you. Because it is the responsibility of the body of Christ to show people Jesus. The body of Christ, the local church, Christians individually, are the only hope of lost sinners to see Jesus. Oh, God could do it a number of different ways. God could put the largest big screen ever to be imagined in the sky and tell everybody Jesus is Lord. He, in fact, He could go a step further and just go ahead and save everybody. But He has chosen to use His people as the instrument by which people hear the good news and by their hearing, the Spirit works in such a way that they become believers. This, this is the way that God has designed it. In fact, it's not our focal passage for the morning. But I'll just go ahead and share with you the truth that Paul shares in chapter 10 of Romans. How then will they call on Him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And then here's the key verse. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We are to be the ones who share this message. And there are thousands who are dying and do not realize it. Oh, they know they're dying physically. But what they do not know is they are dying spiritually. In fact, they're not dying. They are already dead. And it is the Word of God in His Scripture that is the sword that brings life. And we want to pierce as many people as we possibly can. The world is becoming increasingly secular, increasingly atheistic, increasingly contrary to everything that God is. And they need to simply see Jesus. This is the topic of 
focus in John chapter 12. I want to direct you to John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20, and we're going to read through verse 26. John chapter 12, verse 20 through 26, if you've not already made your way there. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. I believe and my desire is to communicate to you this morning that the words out of the mouths of those God-fearing Greeks are the very same words on the lips or at least almost subconsciously in the hearts of every person in our area. In Texas, in America, in the world, every sinner in the world, no matter how heinous or prolific their sin is needs to see Jesus. They need to encounter Jesus. They need to say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Whether we're talking about in church, at work, in the home, everywhere. Notice the situation of these Greeks. The first verse, verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. That's an interesting sentence. They are God-fearers. They're going to worship, but they're not Jewish. Ultimately, their category is still outsider. Even though they're going to worship God. But something about Jesus sparked hope in them. I mean, they had probably heard the accounts of his causing the blind to have sight. They probably had heard of the miraculous raising of Lazarus. They had probably either witnessed or heard about the triumphal entry of Jesus just a few days before into Jerusalem for his final week in his earthly life and ministry. They had probably heard about the cleansing of the temple if they weren't there themselves. And it probably and most definitely led them to say, maybe this Jesus is our hope. Maybe this Jesus is the solution to our problem. Maybe this Jesus is the one that we've been looking for. And so they go to Philip, probably looking for someone to identify with, who can relate to them. And Philip goes to Andrew, who's always bringing somebody to Jesus. He's a beautiful example of what we should be. I wish that we were all Andrews. I wish that I was an Andrew more so than I am. 
I want to just jot down a couple of cross references for that. Look at chapter 1, verses 40 through 42, chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. He's always bringing somebody to Jesus. And then the two of them, Philip and Andrew together, bring them to Jesus. And then, as is not unusual and very common for Jesus, Jesus gives a very complexing response. You know, someone's introduced to you, you probably say, oh, it's so nice to meet you, I'm glad you came. Let's talk. But Jesus always has some enigmatic, deeper statement that he makes. And look at what Jesus says. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And he goes on for two other verses. In a response simply to these men who are coming, to see him, these Greeks, and I would imagine Philip and Andrew felt a little confused to say the least. But Jesus does answer. And here's what's significant about Jesus' answer. It is the answer for how you and I must show Jesus to a lost and dying world. That is our commission. That is our great commission. The great commission of our Lord to Oak Crest Baptist Church, to each of us individually, is that we would show people Jesus just as He shows Himself to these Greeks. And so I want to just share with you three things that we need to be focused on going forward. And we need to implement. And we need to carry out. And we need to be committed to in order to show people Jesus. Just as a side, before I begin these three, you do understand what's at stake. If people do not know Jesus, they are going to a real place called hell. Where the worm never dies, And there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I cannot even put into words the gravity of what we're talking about. Just consider the most excruciating pain, physical and emotional and mental that you've ever experienced. And then magnify that. And you're still not close to what the reality of hell is like. And it is unending. I shared with the Sunday school class just a moment ago We sing so gladly when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. The reverse is equally true. If you find yourself in hell, your chorus will be, when we've been here 10,000 years, Dying eternally. We've no less days to feel this pain than when we first begun. We must tell the story. We must tell the good news. If we know the cure to cancer, and we hold it in. We have committed a great evil. We know the cure to sin. We know the cure to death. We must share it. 
If we're going to show people Jesus, we must show them first and foremost the gospel. In Jesus' response, he gives the gospel in a nutshell. By him, we have life. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus has always been the answer to eternal life. He says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He says to the Samaritan woman, you must be a recipient of the living water. He heals, he restores, he brings eternal life. But with the arrival of these Greeks, something is different. Notice, I want to take you back just a little bit into the book of John. Go back to John chapter 2. Verse 4. This is in the episode when Jesus turns the water into wine at Cana. And look at what He says to His mother in John chapter 2 verse 4. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. He's very explicit. My hour. The time when I will accomplish what I have been sent to accomplish has not yet come. Turn over just a few pages to John chapter 7. Verse 30. Actually, just for context, let's back up to verse 26. Excuse me, verse 25. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and you do not know him. I know him for I come from him and he sent me. And listen to verse 30. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Same exact language as chapter 2, verse 4. Now one more, turn over to chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. And they said to him, therefore, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. It's a theme throughout John. And now... In chapter 12, where we pick up this morning, in verse 23, we have Jesus saying, the hour has come. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Something about the appearance of these Greeks sparks it. Something about the appearance of these Greeks is a sign to Jesus in His own mind that this is the moment that He has been waiting for. And our salvation comes through what He is about to experience over the next short period of time. Through the suffering and the glory of the crucifixion. Of the cross. Our salvation comes through the resurrection through the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. The cross was not the low point of shame for Jesus. It was in fact the high point of glory. 
This is why we call the Friday before Resurrection Sunday, before Easter Sunday, Good Friday. And it can be confusing. Many of you have come to me and said, why do we call it Good Friday? It's a bad day. Jesus dies. And you're right. But in the worst circumstance in the history of the world, God Himself killed is the greatest glory and blessing in the history of the universe. The salvation of worthless sinners. The cross was not defeat. It was glory. It was victory. And if people are going to see Jesus, they must see the Jesus of Scripture for all He is. Not a different Gospel. Not a self-help guru. Not the newest philosophy, not pop culture, Christ crucified. This is the only way of salvation, friends. Christ crucified. As C.S. Lewis famously said, and it is so true, Jesus is not merely a great teacher to be admired for His words of wisdom. Because Jesus is either a liar, meaning He knew what He was saying about Himself was not true, and yet He continued to lie for self-promotion, or He's a lunatic who really thought He was the Son of God. Right? Or He is Lord. And He is who He said He was. So we must fight against a tendency in this day for people to say, I admire Jesus. He's a great teacher. But I don't believe He's God. Why must we fight so vigilantly against that? Because that is not saving faith. That is a denial. And you can't justify it by Scripture. Jesus makes certain claims about Himself. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Equating Himself with God. If He says that, and He's not truly God, then He's either a liar or a lunatic. And if I say to you, I'm a jelly donut, and I truly think that I'm a jelly donut, you will not leave here saying, boy, he's a great teacher. You'll say he's a liar or he's a lunatic. So if people are going to see Jesus, they must see the true Jesus. And every time a minister, a preacher, a pastor steps behind this sacred desk or thousands of others like it around the world, he should envision the people saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. I think that would be a very appropriate little plat. A little engraving here, right where I'm looking. Sir, we want to see Jesus. We we don't want to hear we don't want to hear your jokes. We don't want to he hear what happened to you last week in Walmart. We we don't want to have a recap of an article from Reader's Digest or Sports Illustrated. Sir, we want to see Jesus. And we must be so ever careful not to accommodate the message to men. I heard it once said, I think it was Jack Graham in Prestonwood who said, we must not make 
our message so palatable to man that it makes God sick. Paul says it this way, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, which probably has a lot to do with why when the Gentiles, when the Greeks come to Jesus, is when he recognizes that his hour has come. It's a fulfillment of his ministry, both to Jew and to Greek. So if we're going to show people Jesus, we must show them the gospel. But here's the second thing. If we're going to show people Jesus, we must live for the gospel. Or we might say it this way. We must live the gospel. Look at verse 25. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This is nothing new. This is discipleship. But we so love this world, don't we? Even believers are so prone toward a love for this world. A love for the things of this world and the pleasures of this world and the comforts of this world. And I'm not suggesting, I know that you could take it this way, but I'm not suggesting that, you know, we sell all our possessions and just go live naked out in the desert. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying this. Do you cherish this world as your home? Or do you see yourself as a pilgrim, as a stranger that's passing through this world on your way to home? You think about the example of a soldier serving in Afghanistan. Does he build a three million dollar mansion and marry a woman from Afghanistan and pledge loyalty to Afghanistan? No. He's on a mission. He lives in a tent. He lives in such a way that everything about his life suggests I'm getting out of here as soon as I can. He lived, think about his surroundings. What does he have? He has pictures of his wife and his children. He has picture, uh, an article of his, his game winning touchdown article that was printed in his local paper when he was in high school. He's got a picture of his mom. He's got things that he's brought from home. He's writing letters home. Everything about his life is about home. And everything about his life is not about where he is. Now, you can take my illustration too far. You can take the analogy too far. You know, that we might say that we shouldn't be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, if that's possible. But we should see ourselves as ambassadors, as the Bible says. To live the gospel and to constantly be in the mindset of Galatians 2.20 where we say I'm crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. But Christ lives through me. The life I live in this body, I live not of myself. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Do you live that way? I, I, friends, I'm trying to be very, very transparent and sincere and authentic with you. But if we would live that way, each of us in our families, the community around us would see that and be transformed by that. And that's what I want us to be. To live now 
with eternity in mind. Another way we might name that is to be kingdom minded. Heard a story several years ago about a young girl named Rachel Shoup. This story resonates with me and I remember it well because she was a student at my alma mater, Washita, in Arkansas. She was a freshman and she had taken a course where one of the assignments was to write, to keep a journal, to write a paper in which she described her purpose in life or maybe her prayer for her life. The tragic part of this story is that on the winter break, the Christmas break of her freshman year, while traveling back to the Dallas area where she lived, she was killed tragically in a car accident. She never made it home for Christmas. Obviously, it greatly devastated her family, impacted the Washita community. Her professor sent her paper that she had written to her family. And one particular sentence stands out above all of the others. She says, as a freshman in college, I want to make daily decisions that have eternal significance. I'll say that again. I want to make daily decisions that have eternal significance. If that was consistently our mindset, can you imagine what our lives would look like? And what it means, living for the kingdom, means seeing every person as saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. But see, in their sin state, they don't. Maybe a better sentence to see them as saying is, Sir, we need to see Jesus and we don't know it. We desperately need to see Jesus. In the same way that if you saw a person and they're manifesting a physical symptom, you would say they need medicine. They need to see a doctor. And then you would do everything in your power to help if possible. So if we're going to show people Jesus, we've got to show them the gospel. We've got to live the gospel. But then finally... If we're going to show people Jesus, we've got to work for the gospel. Look at verse 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. The Christian life is one of service to God, service to others, a life in which we see ourselves as slaves of Christ. In the body of Christ, we should have one agenda only, and that is Christ's agenda. Everything we do, we say, what would, what would Jesus have us do? What would God have us do? What would bring honor and glory to God? After all, Jesus is the head of the body. And so any honor or glory we receive is only in Him. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor Him. So anything you do in the life of the body in Christ, if someone compliments you on it, or encourages you or edifies you in it, what do you say? To God be the glory. To God be the glory. He alone gets the glory. Anything that I am that is good is Christ. Because I am only righteous, I'm only justified by an imputed righteousness. I've been declared righteous. 
Christ is my righteousness, right? I'm not inherently good myself. So we're not working on our own, kind of independent from Jesus. We're working in Jesus, seeing where God is working and simply joining Him in what He's already doing. We would never take credit for initiating something. What we need to do is simply see what God would have us to do in our community and follow through. We have a tremendous opportunity right now. We, we've just started or just starting in our outreach efforts. We'll be receiving a list every month of everybody who moves into the Midlothian area. What potential we have to make contact with those people. That if, if we really set our mind to it, and just think about this, if, if we really set out to do this, we could be in a situation where nobody who moves into Midlothian doesn't hear the gospel within the first month of their living in Midlothian. I mean, that's potential. I'm not saying that's what we'll ultimately do. But, but I can answer this. If we have a great commission to go into all the world, teaching all the world, to obey all that Christ has commanded us, would that not be our commission? What else can we do? There are so many possibilities of the kinds of... Midlothian is booming with growth. And I know that's disconcerting to many because we still want our small little country town. But that's not the reality. So we're either going to rise to the challenge of meeting this community where it is and sharing the gospel or we're going to shrink into ourselves and look inwardly. And friends, you guys know me well enough to know I care nothing about numbers. I could care less how many people we have on role or membership. What I do care about is the lost hearing the gospel. And allowing God to do the work. We have been given a task. Is God going to save who He's going to save? Yeah, absolutely. You can go put your head in the sand and every person that is going to be saved, God will save. But you miss the blessing. And you're disobedient. I heard the story of a seminary student. This is in one of those denominations where they get assigned pastorates, you know. They don't go in view of a call, but they're assigned, you know, you're going to go here, you're going to go there. He got a bad assignment. Little church, nowhere town. He was so discouraged. He's complaining to his friend. His friend said something very interesting. He said, you know, the world is a better place because Michelangelo didn't say, I don't do ceilings. The world is a better place because Moses didn't say, I don't do rivers. And Noah didn't say when God commanded him, I don't do arcs. I'm not into construction. Jeremiah didn't say, I don't cry. 
And Amos didn't say, I don't do speeches. And Rahab didn't say, I don't do threads or carpets out windows. And Ruth didn't say, I don't do the mother-in-law bit. And David said, I don't do giants. And Peter said, I don't do Gentiles. No, no, no. I'm not going to witness to Cornelius as a Gentile. Or Mary didn't say, I don't do virgin births. Which she really didn't have a choice, so I guess that's not really a good example, is it? Mary Magdalene didn't say, I don't anoint feet. John the Baptist didn't say, I don't preach in deserts. Paul didn't say, I don't write letters. And most importantly, we are what we are because Jesus didn't say, I don't do crosses. And may it be the reality that Jesus, that Oak Crest doesn't say, we don't do the will of God. We don't do the Great Commission. We don't do that witnessing. We don't do outreach. And why do we say any of this? Because Jesus is the King of Kings. And He is the Lord of Lords. And He is the author and the finisher of our salvation. And we exist to serve Him. And He's told us, go. Go and tell. Go and tell. Tell your barber, tell your stylist, tell your grocer, tell your husband, tell your wife, tell your kids, tell them all. But, but, but we believe that God has elected for Himself a people. They're going to be saved whether we tell or not. You are told to tell. God has the job of saving. We tell everybody. I love the word. <laughs> under, normal, under normal circumstances, it's a very bad word, but I love the word when it comes to outreach and witnessing, we want to be promiscuous. We want to be promiscuous because we don't choose who we're going to tell. We just tell them all. Would you stand with me as we close our time together? Righteous and holy Father. Oh God, alert us to the urgency of telling others about Jesus. Because there are Hundreds, if not thousands, literally within a stone's throw of this building that are on their way to a hell prepared for Satan and his angels. But we have the solution that is the gospel. We cannot save a single soul. Lord, you know that. We cannot persuade a single soul. But somehow in your sovereign providence, you use the speaking of the gospel to accomplish your work of salvation. Let us be simply instruments in your sovereign hand. In Jesus' name.